Welcome everybody to this session. Um, I know people are still coming in, but for time reasons, I think it is good when we start. Let me take off this one. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to this session. I'll give some brief introduction on the session and on the presenters. But first of all, I would really like to thank also the IHF for allowing us the opportunity to share. And we have some really nice examples to share with you. Let me, yeah, here you got our first slide. Um, my name is um, uh, Els, that is short for Elizabeth. And I work at uh, GS1 at Global Office, which is based in Belgium, in Brussels. And I work for the GS1 organization. And what I briefly want to share with you, GS1 is not selling anything. We don't sell anything. We are a standards organization, and the regulations drive manufacturers to put barcodes using the standards on their products, and what we do is in the several countries support our member organizations, which we have in 115 countries, to work with healthcare stakeholders so that they can actually use these standards in the best possible way to support efficiency and patient safety. And um, we work under an anti-competition law caution, so in whatever we share with you this afternoon, there will be no talk on market share prices or whatsoever. If you want to know things like that, please reach out to us outside the session because we are not sharing that here. And um, this is the group that we'll uh, present to you today. I'm just chairing and I'll do a brief summary at the start and a brief summary at the end. We have uh, Maria Ramirez, who will join us online. Maria is based in uh, Andalusia, in the south of Spain, and she will have a great message to share on what they did on getting the logistics uh, more supportive. Then we have Henrik Stilling, who is with us here. And Henrik is IT architect in a large region in Denmark, and he will share a great message on how in building a new hospital, they are making optimal use of the standards and with the benefits of patient safety and efficiency. And then we have with us Albert Tarats, and uh, I wanna, want you to welcome all of them, but Albert especially, because he uh, accepted our invitation only this weekend because the person who was to speak uh, due to personal circumstances couldn't make it, and Albert has taken over. So he will present for you a lot of the work that's done under Logarithm, which is the logistics provider of the uh, Catalan uh, Health Service. And then it's my name again. But you can see the people on top. And Maria will, is online, so she will join us in a minute. Why do we want to share this message with you? Um, I'm a medical doctor by profession, and my heart has been crying in the past two years. When this pandemic started, you know, I was so upset. I said to my husband, what am I doing? I'm a healthcare person. I've worked in acute care all of my life, and now I sit at my laptop Zoom meeting all day. And I was really a bit upset. I felt I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Because my friends working in hospital, and you heard already this morning in the sessions, there was so much sharing on the great work that has been done by healthcare providers in the past month. And uh, then I suddenly realized through a question I got from my work at GS1, that at GS1, we are at the best place. I was at the best place during this pandemic because with all our knowledge on standards, on logistics, on supplies, we could support in our global network in many, many places to get supplies at the right time. There were supplies stopped at borders, and we could, through our network, support that the supplies could pass the borders so the protective materials and medications could actually reach the places where they could be used in patient care. And why are we, you know, the people who are sharing with you in this session, why are we sharing our message? Because what you see on this slide is so true for us. Our heart is in healthcare delivery. And when you look at supply chain, it, you know, it sounds a funny word, but the supply chain 
is just there to bring the product to the patient. So we support that these people, who you, sorry, these people that you see on screen, that they can actually, sorry, I, now I'm, I'm back here, that you see these people here on screen who treat the patients, here you see they treat the patients, that they can have safe products at the correct time and the correct products. That's what we do and that's where our heart is. And that's what we will share with you also today. Part of what we want to share with you in this session is that at the end you will understand that the global standards actually facilitate safe and efficient healthcare and that you will learn a bit from the experience that the people who will present their case studies to you, how they have worked in the COVID pandemic and what has supported them. It will also help you understand that global standards help in rationalizing your assortments and by that also saving a lot of products. And you will have a full traceable chain from the manufacturer who has to put the barcode on the product, otherwise the regulator doesn't allow them to sell their products in the market. And then if a product already has a barcode, why wouldn't you further in the line as a GPO or as a healthcare provider use the barcode and use it for the benefits in your organization? That's what we wanna share with you today. Just a few words, why do we need standards? And I just put a slide here with a lot of the plugs. And those of you who have traveled, and I assume everybody will have been in other countries, you will know that when you go to another country, you need to be prepared. Because otherwise, if you want to recharge your laptop, sorry, the plug doesn't fit in the socket. So you always need to travel with these connection points. And one of the things, if you look at healthcare, in healthcare delivery, there's a lot of standardization, there's a lot of protocols, and the standards, the GS1 standards, will help um, standardize the, the route from the product up to the patient. Uh, so that's why we need standards. You need standards everywhere. Then, what does the GS1 do? I just summarized here, the supply chain brings medical products to the patients. And in the supply chain, there is, a specific, there is a specific standard for a location so that you can know where is the product at which location. Uh, there is a specific standard for the product. And then you can see this product, medical device or a pharmaceutical or even a paper clip or a, a mask. You can easily find where is it where did it come from and where is it going to? And that is what, uh, looking at a hospital and at a healthcare system, uh, we are this tiny bit because there are a lot of priorities. But if this gets implemented, it will help uh, supply, uh, it will help, uh, in the end, it will also help save patient care. So what we sometimes say is even if the standardization using the GS1 standards is just a minor thing in a large healthcare process. It's complex challenges that can be supported by uh, a simple scan. And that means that you can identify the barcodes, capture the barcode using the scanner, and you can share using electronic platforms. And it can be used for medication, for medical devices, for masks, for whatever. And um, to summarize the GS1 system, we have standards that work on identification. They can identify locations, they help to identify products, they help to identify uh, transport and pallets, etc. And then we have standards that are there to capture. So the barcode, uh, the RFID, they are there to capture the information, the data that is in. And then we have standards that are used for exchange of data, which we then call share. So simply identify, capture and share. That's where we support. This is one example I want to share with you before we move to uh, Maria to share her presentation. If you, for instance, look at 
implants. And we are in Spain. Spain is a part of the European Union. And in the European Union, all medical devices and implants are very important medical devices. By regulation, they need to have a barcode on their uh, package. Um, we are the standardization organization that will help manufacturers to put the barcode on the product. We are not the ones designing the system. You know, that's regulators and that's not us. But we help manufacturers to put the barcode on the product. We help hospitals to understand how can you then process that so that it will actually help in patient care. And when this is implemented, you will have you will need seamless IT solutions. That is something that Henrik will also talk about. It will support in full stock visibility and also where is the stock? Not only what do you have, but also where is the stock? It will support in reordering and um, uh, you will, Albert will also share something on that. And it will in the end facilitate the work of nurses because they don't need to write everything down, but they can simply scan and the system will upload. And you can, if need be, if there is a recall, you can trace back which patients do you need to recall or where is the stock and can you remove it from the stock room before it's used on patient care. So what we say, it supports in global product traceability and in that way also in patient safety. This is what I wanted to share with you at the start. What we will do now, we will go over to Maria, who will share her message with you. If you have questions, please add your questions in the app. And when we have had all presentations, we are more than ready to answer all your questions. And please ask whatever question you want to ask. If we cannot answer given the time, we will uh, be around so that we can discuss afterwards as well. Okay, we can go over to Maria then. Thank you, Wells. Oh, good. We can, yeah. hear, we can hear you, Maria, but we cannot yet see you. Huh? I'll continue a bit of talking until we can see Maria. Yeah. Ah, okay. here is Maria. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> good to see you. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, I, about the presentation, I don't know if I have to share that uh, with the application or, or when I start to, to speak, someone is going to show it. No, Maria, you can use, the, you can use the, your deck to present. Okay, share the, the screen, no? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry, Marie. Um, yes, now we see your presentation. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. My name is Maria Ramirez, and I am in charge of logistics in the Andalusian Healthcare Service. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to participate in the World Hospital Congress and to have the opportunity to share with all of you one of the most important projects we have carried out in Andalusia Health Service to improve the efficiency of the processes that supports the care activity. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank GS1 for their support in this project in, and for counting us in this session. Before getting into the project, I would like to, to share with you 
some facts about Andalusia and the Andalusian Health Service. Andalusia is located in the south of Spain and is the most populated autonomous community in the country, with about eight and a half million inhabitants and the second largest, with eight seven thousand square kilometers. Andalusian Health Service, SAS, for us, is an autonomous body affiliated to the Ministry of Health of the Autonomous Regional Government of Andalusia. As you know, in Spain, healthcare is decentralized through the 17 autonomous communities. We provide a specialized health care via 50 hospitals with more than 15,000 beds and more than 500 operating rooms. And we provide primary health care with more than 1,500 primary care centers. SAS is equipped with almost 100,000 healthcare professionals and a budget of 9,000 million of euros. These figures give a clear idea of the magnitude of the challenge of equipping this organization with a corporate, a corporate logistics solution that meets the supply chain requirements of all its preventive care, medical assistance, and health promotion systems and service. The organization of purchasing and logistic service has evolved significantly over the last two decades, 20 years. In order to understand the starting point and the evolution of the transformation process, the Andalusian Health Service had a multi-centric logistics system that has been replaced by a systemic and integration centered, centered focus and a cooperative vision based on the intensive use of information and communication technologies. We currently have eight provincial logistics platforms, a single catalog and a product bank in which we have identified all the medical devices, about 300,000 products with Yetin. The demand for products and service from all the centers has also been centralized and consolidated, as well as the purchasing and suppliers. Initially, the development of the transformation project took two forms. Firstly, the concept of corporate logistics, defined as the sets of facilities, materials, and professional resources to meet the needs of the center in this regard. Secondly, the integral logistic system, our management system, configured as a set of IT applications used for the management of the logistic procedures carried out through the corporate logistic system. From this moment on, the Andalusian Health Service undertook the following lines of actions. First, established infrastructures to enable traceability and efficiency logistic management. Second, normalization and generalization of requirements in relation to logistic service for purchases. Third, identification and inventory facilities of facility, material and professional resources and organizational means used for logistic purposes. Fourth, identification and normalization of management processes and procedures. Five, 
this side of the platform. For the management of the cooperative logistics system, this platform focused its course of action in two directions. The management of goods and their traceability with GS1 and the management of business mess messages with the GS1 standard for electronic data interchange, EDI. Regarding the management of goods and their traceability, the procedures incorporated into the platform have been based on the full implementation of the GS1 identification standard. We established coding and symboli, symbology requirement based on GS1 standards for all products acquired by the Andalusian Health Service. The objective of this initiative, initiative was to promote the effective use of automatic product identification system within the supply chain of healthcare facilities in order to maximize the reliability of product identification during the management of its logical movements. About the second point, the management of business messages, EDI, we established a standard protocol of communication of business messages with our providers. We use the order message, order, the delivery note, DESADV, confirmation of reception, RECADV, invoice, invoice, and general message, messages, uh, general. In relation to the development of EDI messages, an EDI guide was published to facilitate implementation by provider, which was agreed in GS1 Spine with a working group with all the regional health service. We currently have the EDI system implemented with 300 suppliers of medical device and implants, as well as medicines. And we have reached the figure of more than 150,000 transacted documents each month. Finally, I would like to share with you the benefits and key learning that the Andalusian Health Service was achieved as a result of implementing GS1 standard in the organization and also of promoting them with suppliers. The introduction of GS1 standard identification and the order to catch standardized messages has resulted as a significant, significant improvement in process efficiency in different areas such as I That's okay? Yeah, you're still here. Okay. Uh, repeat the last. The introduction of GS1 standard identification and the order to catch standardized, standard, standardized messages has resulted uh, in a significant improvement in process efficiency in different areas such as uh, organization in product reception and stock reduction at the logistic platform. Increased productivity to staff who can now focus on higher value added processes. It has also allowed us to improve product recall through improved visibility. Automatic integration of product traceability information, transparency and data quality, increased management and communication efficiency Error, minimis, error minimization, time and cost saving. Savings are mainly due to the automat, automat, 
automation of processes that increase productivity, but also to the elimination of paper and the creation of new electronic files. And last but not least, they provide increased patient safety. In conclusion, I would like to encourage the hospital sector to adopt efficiency practices such as the use of GS1 standard at a time when the industry is probably much more ready to join the product, the project in collaboration with hospital that it was more than one decade ago, 10 years ago, when we started this ambitious but necessary project. In an increasingly demanding and um, budget constraining, constrained environment, we are obligated to be much more efficient by always putting patient's safety at the center of our strategies. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, Maria. Thank you very much for sharing such a good message and thank you also for sharing it in English with us. You did very, very well. Uh, Maria will stay with us, so at the end you can uh, ask your questions to Maria. And I trust you all heard the great work she has done on organizing in a large region the supplies, the logistical platform, so that they can really have uh, much more efficiency and patient safety. Um, with that, Maria, thank you. We will move to our next presenter now, and please stay with us for the Q&A. Okay. Then I would like to invite Henrik, and Henrik will briefly introduce himself, but all I want to say is uh, he can share uh, on work that, ha work that has been done from, for many years before we ever thought there was a pandemic. And in his presentation, he will also share with us what are the benefits of being so well prepared. So Henrik, over to you. Thank you very much, Elf. Thank you for having me here in uh, Barcelona. My name is uh, Henrik Stilling. I'm an uh, IT architect with the Central Denmark region, like you're in Midtjylland in Danish. We take care of one fourth of the healthcare uh, services in Denmark. I work in logistics, locationing, and identification. Being in a hospital, identification is at all levels from supply goods to implants, to mention a few. My focus is process management and technology adaption, and I w started in this field 12 to 13 years ago. I'd like to take you away from this conference, away from COVID-19, to a mountaintop in Germany. Just let you float away and think. If you were standing here, what would you be feeling? What would you be thinking? Probably this place would be so silent that all you could hear was your own breath. And that so suddenly became very, very important. Air, oxygen. We used to be able to get it ourselves. Suddenly, we had a lot of patients who needed support to breathe. I'll get back to this ventilator at the end of the story. He didn't end up playing the key role, but we prepared him to do. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we did with the standards to make sure that he wasn't out of work when we needed him. This is also University Hospital. That's about 45% uh, of the production cap capability in the Central Denmark region. This area here is the size of a small Danish city. We have uh, 500,000 square meters of a hospital. 
when we set out to build this, one of the first things that we discovered was that everything would go missing inside this building. So what is the supply chain into the hospital? You get all our deliveries over here, hundreds of trucks each day. If it stops there and the traceability ends in this building. So we needed to look at what we had to do to make sure that everything was in the right place at the right time. And we realized that we needed to move away from, sorry, can you, I'm, I'm moving too far away from the microphone, thank you. We, uh, we realized we needed to move from what's, uh, what we would like to call, yeah, okay, uh, from a structural logistics to an information-based logistics. You know, the train tracks are very easy to understand. They go between known points and it has a very high throughput and it's very easy to plan a very narrow set of services. But when you have a hospital our size that has basically all the uh, surgical specialities and the uh, somatic specialities that you need inside a hospital, you have to do something else. So we're trying to move to an information-based version. And I have a few pictures here that could explain what I mean by information-based. The, the picture here on the left, that's from around 1900. The saying at that time was that if you are a nurse, you need to take care of a ward. You need to have line of sight to know what's going on and to make the right decision to take care of the patients. Over here, we are in the 1950s. As you can see, the room is smaller. By chance, there are more nurses here. But one of the things that made it possible to make smaller rooms and still have nurses take care of the patients not being on site all the time is that at, in this point of time, we've inter introduced a nurse call. So the patient could get hold of the nurse by using information. You knew there was a problem, you know you needed to do something. This is our hospital today. More than 50% of all rooms for patients are single patient rooms. This is, this is a challenge because we need to know what's going on inside each and every room. I'm still a uh, moment, okay, sorry about that. Um, inside each and every one of these rooms. So what we are doing is making a digital twin of the room. We have the identity of the room. We know which assets are inside the room and we know the patient. And of course we know why the patient is in the room. And we're using the GS1 standards to get to this point. This is not a project. This is a capability. We've been working on this since 2009 and we still have this very simple vision that we automatically want to re register location and identity of mobile objects at a given time and we want to make that information available to as many systems that is feasible so actually we're just trying to answer the question of what where and when and because we have a very excellent staff at the hospital, they add the quality parameters to that. We are building on standards and we are splitting them into different parts. There's the item identification level, there's the traceability part, which location are we in, of course there's time, and then there's the interoperability part here. Maria spoke about EDI. We are using uh, another standard called the EPCIS. That's Electronic Product Code Information Services. And this system has a vocabulary that you can use to tell what's going on with the items that are inside your hospital. And the story for another day is how we made that into a service system. So we decoupled the systems that are producing the information 
from the application that are consuming this information to make it widely avail available across applications. This is another view of where we are applying the different standards. Uh, I urge you to go back and look at this one to get a better view of what, what we are doing with which standards and where they are uh, implemented. But this is what the standards look like on an everyday basis inside the hospital. You don't see standards anywhere here, but they are all over the place. We use GTIN, GRAI, GIAI for single items. We have introduced radio frequency identification throughout the entire hospital. So when a trolley moves around the hospital, we know where it is inside the hospital. The hospital is divided into 2,500 zones, so we know if something has been tracked into that zone, uh, that that's where we need to go look for stuff. So we only have to know what we're putting inside the trolleys. At a so some level, we are also using this on medical devices and for a few very valuable um, trade items. This information is integrated into the everyday um, healthcare systems. So if I need something, for instance, this is a plan for surgery on a given day in one of our uh, operating wards, you can look into this information and say, okay, I know I have this patient. I know I'm going to do this procedure. I've ordered these sterile goods to be delivered at that point. And then I can see here how far on is the goods, because we have a, our sterilization department is 400 meters away from the nearest operating theater. So you have the daily overview. And of course, in here, if you're doing a large complex operation that might be 12, 15, 20 hours, you know you have continuous deliveries. We provide the same information in here. And afterwards, we look at it. This is a heat map saying, OK, there are a lot of sterile goods here. They went, spent more time here, and actually a lot of it ended up here, which is another one of our, one of our operating wards. Don't spend too much time on this picture. Just know that when I get back to this later, that we produce this kind of information without really knowing what we want to do with it. And of course, you can search on a point basis and say, if I need exactly this device, you can get an overview of where it's placed. This is a daily production uh, throughput from our uh, sterilization department. Over here, we have the number of trolleys that arrive on a weekly basis, and you can actually go into a daily basis here, to the sterilization department. And over here, you have the average backlog to the same day. This is really nice when you have the information, you can plan and you can do everything and it, it's all great. Please take a look up here. This is back in 2018, just before Christmas. The backlog is larger than the throughput at this time. Anyone who works in a hospital knows this is a really, really big problem. But what was happening here is that when everything came to a halt, we had been producing the information about what was happening inside the hospital using the GS1 standards for about four years at this point. So the what, where, and when on the sterile goods trailers gave us the opportunity to go into the data and say, well, what is the real problem here? Because everybody was saying, well, we have too few trolleys and we have uh, way too, too few people in the sterilization department, in the staff there. We cannot uh, keep up with production. I'll give you a, a, a bit of a clue, because the slide you saw before only has a 5% staff increase compared to this slide. We went in and looked at the data and said, where is everything? What's happening to it? And where is the real congestion? And what we looked at here, if I can change this, is this one. How many trolleys are where on an average basis? 
And this one is even more important because this is the number of trolleys arriving in the area where we are, are counting the backlog. And we went into this and said, oh, should we go out and do what everybody had their gut feeling telling them? We need to be able to cope with this level of production. No, we didn't do that. We went the other way around and said, okay, if you look at this graph, there's plenty of white space here in between. So if we can move production of the trolleys arriving here into all this space here, you have a solution. And what we did was actually say, oh, everyone comes to work at the same time. That's not really ideal because if you start operating at 7.30 and you start expecting instruments to come back to be cleaned at 7.30, everyone's gone home when the instruments arrive at the civilization department. So we changed these schedules by looking at the data. And by doing that, we moved into the, air, uh, the time of day where we had room to handle the problem. So by 5% increase in production capability, we removed a, product, uh, a problem that actually looked like we couldn't handle 100% of what was coming in on a given day. So we are changing this from who did what using the traceability to who can do what. And this is what you're going to hear if you start looking at GS1 standards, transparency. You're giving people the ability to make their own choices, making the right decision, because building business rules that takes care of this is going to take you forever. You need people who have information just like the nurses back in the 1900s, they can see, could see what they had to do, give them the information, then they can take, make the right decision. And of course, a lot of this is quality assurance. If we know we are taking the right step in the production cycle, we know that everything has the right quality. So by registering the steps through the sterilization process, for instance, we know that we, are, we can introduce these instruments to a patient without causing infections and so on. And why is this scalable? Well, because a lot of people are using it. That's why you saw the regular uh, juicy fruit at the bottom left corner of the, uh, the, my presentation slide. This is not a standard that we have been introducing, especially for the healthcare sector. No, I used to say that 80% is what's going on to, uh, supply chain wise inside the hospital is not really healthcare related. We just said, well, we use the same standards for what's highly specialized for healthcare as well as toilet paper that's putting it out on a broad distance but it's actually what we're doing and we know we have the right uh, stuff available for us so it's not just a healthcare method and it's for everyone you have to push the information to whoever needs it hopefully with a, a, as little education as possible and now we're back back to the ventilator because we took this method back in February 2020, we were starting to talk about what, what should we do, what do we need to do to handle this. And some of our doctors contacted uh, um, the people handling this in Italy, and the first thing they said, above everything else, you need to supply oxygen to your patients. We don't know which medicines, we don't know which tools, we don't know which uh, um, stuff you need to, to, uh, to shield yourself. But we know one thing, if they don't get more oxygen than they get from their own breathing, you have a problem. So what we did was to say, well, our oxygen supply is pretty good and it's locally produced in Denmark. So we, we knew that the, ex the oxygen was okay. But the machines, the ventilators, where were they? How many did we have? And what could we do with them? Actually, we knew how many we were supposed to have because that's very well managed and you can go into the uh, accreditation system and see we have, we have this many ventilators. And then we start asking, where are these ventilators? Well, they are probably at a given point in the intensive care area because we usually use them by the same beds. And then someone said, well, we are going to turn 250 beds into intensive care beds. So we're going to start to move these ventilators around. And then it was a pretty easy decision to say, we're going to use the RFID 
tracking system put in GS1 identifiers on these, connecting them with the GLNs. So if we come into the situation that we need to utilize the entire set of ventilators inside our hospital, we don't have them standing around in storage rooms instead of being by the patients. It took us three days to tag 130 ventilators and making them available. Luckily, we didn't get to the level where we needed all of them. I, I guess we have around 30% utilization, but, but we know that we expanded our intensive care capability with 200% moving it away from the intensive care units and handle it in these single bedrooms. So when you have these rooms with the information level that we are using, you can turn them into whatever you want them to be if you have the staff and the information to handle that. Because a hospital is a fairly simple building. It's how you use it and how you use the information inside it that gives us the possibility to help a patient. Thank you. Thanks, Henrik. That's a great message. Please a reminder, if you have any questions, whether you are here or whether you joined us virtually, put them in the app and we can retrieve the questions and they can be answered afterwards. And this was a very nice message on uh, how you can support the direct patient care by having your total insight in your equipment and being able to shift them. With that, uh, I would like, I just cleaned your clicker for you. Uh, I would give the floor to Alberta Ratz. Please come up, Albert. We have to stay close to the mic, otherwise the people online miss us. Okay. That was the problem. And uh, as I said at the beginning, Albert uh, had short time to prepare his message, but he has a great message to share with us. And um, um, uh, maybe you will introduce yourself yeah. shortly. OK, thanks. Well, first of all, I think I'm very excited with your presentation, Henry. We are far away from here, from there, but I hope in the future we can avoid an effort this, this, this kind of, of, of situation that you have in Denmark. It's, it's fabulous. Well, I don't know. This one? No. Click the hey, other one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Well, hello and good afternoon to all of us. I am Alberta Ratz. I'm the director of the Logarima. The Logarima is a public company in which the Catalan Institute of Health has the majority stake. Its role is to be the logistics operator of the institute. So, as you can, as you can see, my work is deeply interconnected with the project as on the use of GS1 standards. To start, I would like to introduce the Catalan Institute of Health, also known as X in the acronym in Catalan. It's, it's if not you prefer to sit, you can look at the screen. And yeah. they can film me? Uh, you can still film him if he sits here? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because then you don't need to look back. Yeah. Make, it, make it a bit more easy. Thank you. Well, well, uh, the, the Catalan Institute of Health, it's DX, no? Okay. X is a public company, as is Logarima, and it's also the largest public health company in Catalonia. More precisely, it manages eight hospitals with more than 140 operating rooms and more than 3,000 beds. Also, it provides services through its primary care centers, more than 1,000, to the majority of the population in Catalonia. In this context is where the improvement strategy and the use of GS1 standards is framed. Within the modernization strategy of X economic department, the decision to centralize the purchase of goods was taken almost 15 years ago. For that reason, they made a series of tools which will be explained more thoroughly later. First of all, a unique catalog was created. 
Second, an agreement would reach to use SAP as a crossing-cutting information system. Third, the entire organization was remodeled to be able to centralize procurement and purchasing through public procurement. Noticeably, this required a change in policies and policies within the system, as until now, each hospital and center made individual purchases. Finally, the creation of Logarima was set to support this project. As previously mentioned, Logarima is the public company that I manage, and that is the logistic operator of all the X business networks. To have an idea of the magnitude of the orders that are carried out in this slide can appreciate the numbers. First, Logarima, as a logistic operator, manage more than 160,000 order lines each year. And second, X, through local purchase, reached 213,000 order lines, with prosthesis and implants being the most relevant. And that's the project that we are achieving now. As part of the modernization project of the Department of Economic Management, that we have the director here, the decision to implement GS1 standards was taken along with the decision to centralize purchasing. As you will note throughout the presentation, Logarimna is applying EDI to all of the, its relationship with providers. And now we are trying to apply EDI in all hospitals. In addition, Logis Data is also being created, which is the global data sequencing networks project that is part of GS1 standard. This strategic decision was taken to incorporate GS1 standard with a series, a series of aims. First, all the, my companies said, first to comply with the legal fulfillment eh, according with the decrees, the royal decrees in Spain. Second, deliver patient safety through the creation of a unique product identification. Third, there was a need to improve logistical processes. By, pre, by doing project product replacement through consumption capture, as well as warehouse in and out tracking. Fourth, to allow clinical process costing. The, the facilitation of cost allocation was needed. Lastly, the improvement, the improvement of the quality of information and the communication was done through EDI. How has the implementation of EDI in Logarima been? When, once the decision was taken to centralize purchasing and create logistic operator in 2007, all orders were sent to supplier by fax and mail. We also started working with the first EDI messages. Next, in 2010, we replaced fax emails with online EDI incorporating all suppliers' message orders. Then, in 2011, this whole system was implemented to the fullest with a request to suppliers, response to requests, dispatch notice, as well as confirmation of receipt. In conclusion, today, Logarima is using EDI for almost all its management. In this slide, we can see the figures of the evolution of the usage of EDI within Logarima. As you can see, in the period from 2019 to 2021, the use of EDI has been increased. We use the standard with the most suppliers, and with those who cannot, we use an intermediate company that facil facilitates the management to suppliers. The future goal is for everyone to use the standard directly, but for the time being, there are small businesses that cannot afford it. the implementation of EDI in hospitals. Not now that we have seen the implementation of EDI to Arima, we must turn to the implementation in hospitals. Currently, the Institute is implementing EDI in the management of direct purchase from hospitals. In short, they are trying to replace the actual system, which is similar to Logarima 14 years ago, from orders by fax, mail, to the EDI standard. Of course, as you would expect, this line of work optimizes and improves the processes associated with the manual treatment of documentation 
by avoiding errors in order, delivery, or notes and invoices. But how was the implementation process in hospitals? We moved one too fast. Oui. Uh, <laughs> but how was the implementation process in hospitals? During 2020, the Bell Beach Hospital, one of the biggest hospital which is within the organization of X, made all the implants orders through EDI. During this year, 2021, we expected all hospitals to implement message EDI in implants orders. And lastly, we expect that by the start of next year, all hospitals will be using EDI for all the products, not only implants. As previously mentioned, EDI is a standard platform that helps us with economic management. Thus, the EDI platform is the point of intersection between SAP ECOFIN, the ERP of X, which is the platform to manage all of the finance sector of the institute and the providers. Overall, it could be said that EDI is the communication platform from providers of the institute. Then, for EDI to work, the Institute created an EDI guide. The guide describes the communication model between X and the provider. This guide includes the following series of sections and obligations. And then you can read the, the, the different uh, points that we have to, to put in the, in the guide. In order for you to understand what the guide implies, I will explain the implant circuit as a case study. As you know, the Institute managed the entire company through SAP. There is a healthcare SAP, that is a medical record, and an economic and financial SAP. First, the order of need is defined by the health professionals, who then register it in the healthcare SAP. Parallelly, the order is generated in the economic and financial sub. This is passed to the EDI to the suppliers who generate the, all the order, dispatch, and invoice order. What about the implementation of GDSN? Logic Data Project, it's easy for us. But that is a uh, The Catalan Institute of Health has become the first public institution in Spain to incorporate databases with GS1 identification standards into its electronic tenders for the provision of materials. This system allows both suppliers and X to save time and reduce risk of errors in the procurement process. From the start of the project, any company wishing to become an X supplier can enter the technical characteristic of the product in offer it offers in the, GDS, in the Logic Data Catalog. In this way, when the X launches a public tender to, for the provision of a product, it can now compare the different proposals entered into the program by the companies that have shown interest in the tender. The introduction of this solution saves time for the technical committees that evaluate supply tenders. This is the result of Logic Data project, ensuring that the necessary information is collected for a tender using a standardized, a standardized format. It also reduces the probability of errors when companies submit documentation and, in a tender, and when once the supplier has been selected, materials orders are placed. So far, errors have been detected in approximately 15% of the orders a figure that is expected to be significantly reduced with the new system. Logic Data also allows product information to be synchronized with the logistic platform used by X. That's logarithm. Well, that brings us to the end of the presentation. On a final note, I would like to stress the great effort that we are making in implementing the use of ES1 standards which will help us to provide a better system to our citizens by making it more efficient and cost-effective. Lastly, I would like 
to thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you. I'll just do, please, if you have questions, add them in the box. I've already seen some, so we will get back to the questions to get them answered uh, soon. I briefly want to share with you a few things as a summary of this session, and we really look forward to have a Q&A and a discussion uh, with you afterwards. This is what I showed at the start and what I really want to show again when we summarize. Our heart is in healthcare delivery. Our heart is in how can we get the best materials to the patients so that the doctors and nurses who are at the end of the line treating the patients, that they don't need to wonder whether will they have the correct product at the correct time. And uh, a lot of our work, therefore, is in support. And I hope that this session also helps you understand that a hospital is all about caring for patients. And you need doctors and nurses for that. But in order for them to do their work properly, they need support staff. They need uh, people like Henrik who talk about IT and understand IT and can build the interoperability systems. They'll need people like Maria and like uh, Albert who help on procurement, on building logistic platforms so that it will all be uh, at the right time, at the right patient. Um, if we look at healthcare, and the pandemic has done uh, quite a lot on this, if we look at healthcare, healthcare is moving. You've also seen in the slide Hendrik showed, it's only a number of years ago that there were many patients in one ward and that there was nurses close to patients uh, watching them. Uh, and you saw the picture from his new hospital and I know that that's still an exception. Not many hospitals in the world will have a one bedded room where you can watch patients uh, also you know, at a little bit of distance. There are still many places where patients will have to share rooms. But it's the future. And the future is also what you can see here. There'll be much more technology. Healthcare will be much more digital. And healthcare might be more remote and there might be more health, more e-health in future. I hope that all of us, wherever we are working in healthcare, will remember that Wherever we are, it is all about the patient. And if we keep the patient at the center, that will help us look at patient care in the best possible way and look at uh, how can we improve and how can we sustain what we have developed. These developments that you see in, this, in the left side of this uh, slide also enforce the fact that we need increased standardization. Because when you digitalize, you need to standardize. Otherwise, you know, how can, if your, if your procurement system doesn't link to your warehouse management system, and that doesn't link to your patient record, how will the information be possible to flow from one side to the other? And if you have different IT systems that do not communicate with each other, you'll have an issue. So there'll be increasing standardization. And for that, we think that there'll be really uh, the barcodes and the barcode scanning, which will support. Because if you scare the barcode on the medical product when it enters the hospital and the information flows into the procurement system and from the procurement system, it flows to the warehouse management system. And as Albert shares, it will flow through the systems and finally reach the patients. Then the nurse only needs to scan at the bedside of the patient. And immediately, the information can flow back so that it can be pre-ordered, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a support. And we think that healthcare is moving towards a more technological, digital world. But it will always need people, staff, to care for the patients. Also, we know that there are barriers. In this picture on the right, you can see someone in the theater, in an operating room, who is scanning 
uh, the materials that are being prepared for the surgery that the patient will need. How do we get to the situation? Because there are still many places in the world where we do not yet have this kind of barcode scanning. And you heard when Albert started, he said to Hendrik that you, know, you hope for, to be able to set the next steps to get to that stage. I know Henrik would love to answer the question if he is ready with his work, but you can ask him later on. Um, when I was working as a medical doctor in a hospital, you know, I would know which nurse I wanted when I did surgery. And I would know which nurse would make me nervous because I then would know maybe I do not have the right material at the right time. I wouldn't bother about where the materials came from. They just had to be there. You know, the whole supply chain was something that I didn't know of. I'm happy I know now, but I was somewhere here. I was unaware of what the barcode scanning could do to support me and make me feel more at ease in the work I was doing. And one of the things we have to do, and that's why I'm so happy to see all of you here, is how can we work on overcoming the ba barriers that we do understand that the supply chain in a hospital is needed and that we, in the end, will unconsciously, you know, it will be there. We have people like Albert who help set up the whole logistical system. We will have people like Maria who will join us again in a minute who helps that there is, a com in a complete large region, there is a complete logistical platform that will help say what medical devices are where and where are they needed, can they be shifted, and we need people like Henrik who help set up the complete IT uh, solutions that we need to process the data. And then, you know, our patients need to feel at ease. And when the doctor or the nurse are not at ease, the patient will immediately sense that something is not at ease. And patients that are at ease are the best treated ones. Just a brief summary, the foundation of everything we do with the GS1 standards is you, sorry, you capture the data which are in a data matrix or in uh, just the numbers, you know, what is it? It's just a number, but in this information is the data are captured. You scan them with a barcode scanner the information gets into your IT systems and is processed, making use of what uh, Albert said, the, uh, the EDI standard, or the one that Hendrik mentioned, the EPCIS standard. And then if we, this is our last slide that we want to share with you. Healthcare professionals, please let's all keep that in mind. Healthcare professionals are really the backbone of care. But in order for healthcare professionals to deliver good care, support staff is very, very essential. And I think you heard from all of the stories, success doesn't come overnight. But I heard three enthusiastic people share with us that there have been strategic decisions, a consistent vision, that they were able to involve the correct staff and that they were able to build an integrated supply chain where the medical product really flows up to where uh, the clinical areas are. Whatever we do, we have to be very mindful that we need interoperability of processes and systems, so we need to sit with the healthcare professionals to understand their processes and align with the things that we think could help them and you need a consistent step-by-step -step approach. And are we done tomorrow? No. Are we done the day after tomorrow? No. And this pandemic showed us very, very clear that being well prepared does help set uh, the standards for quick improvement. And uh, so, last line here, we trust that when these global standards, they are on the products, the manufacturers all over the world are supposed to have the barcodes on their products, so why not use it in our next steps in healthcare so that we can have full visibility within a hospital and through the hospital also to uh, the patient and from the patient back again to where the product came from. 
that's the last content slide, so to say, that we wanted to share with you. I would like to invite Hendrik to come up on the platform as well, and then please uh, make Maria online again for us, and then we will go to the Q&A session. So I will also sit again. And then we will all have our masks on again. <laughs> We have received a few questions, and uh, yeah, okay, I can see as well. First, first uh, I want to thank you, presenters, for sharing your great messages because that has really been, really been very helpful, also to see the bigger picture. Um, a very important question that I think we can ask all of you. So I will start with uh, Maria. Um, Maria, uh, how did, can you tell us how you involved your staff? It's not just you at your laptop who makes people enthusiastic and helps them to get engaged, and you can't do this all by yourself. What was needed to get your staff involved? Mm, my staff? Yes. Uh, my staff am I. I am the, the only <laughs> one <laughs> dedicated to EDI in the SAS. <laughs> um, uh, about the, the standards, about yes. all the standards, the, the first step was uh, involve the, the boss in this moment. And I think the, the most important a question was the safes and it was very very clear when we when we use a, an study un, un, un study of gs1 spain with administrative efficiency monitor that analyzed the benefits of the use of standard tools for companies and the impact of these practices on as administrative processes and associate costs in the fast-moving consumer good sector. And in the particular case of the Andalusian Health Service supply chain uh, to calculate the potential saving when the, it represents an annual and global saving of 17 millions euros in the SaaS supply chain, it was easy to, to involve the, the boss and, and all the, the people who have to decide. That is a great answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, 17 million, that is a lot. <laughs> Yes. You can do a lot with 17 million. And, um, and thank you for sharing that that was 17, great. 17. Yes. Ah, uh, no, 17. OK. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great drive to get people engaged. Let me ask uh, Henrik, how yeah. did you get your staff engaged? Well, uh, first of all, let me say, um, I'll start somewhere else, because uh, what we found out uh, through years of uh, interoperability system was that data without purpose is just noise. And what we found out when we started to build this humongous hospital was that we're going to stretch the supply chain, among other things. And we went out and, and talked to every parts of the, the staff, the nurses, the service assistants, the doctors. And they were actually very insecure because they were used to talking to the guy who supplied the, the goods they needed, or some salesman would come by. But now everything's originated from, through this, uh, uh, this uh, supply center. So our involvement was to talk to them and say, what kind of level of communication about what's happening in the supply chain do you need? But starting out, the, the, they said, well, I don't want to wait. And then we mm -hmm. made workshops and involved different parts of the hospital. There's a difference if you're in a medical uh, care facility other than in a, 
a surgical facility or psychiatric facility and found out where were their worries and where, what kind of information do you need to, to provide at different levels. And we, we found out through that work that, that when, where, uh, what, where, and when altogether could solve so many different use cases. And we set out with a large catalog from that and actually just delivered on about 5% to make the business case for this. Okay, thanks. Then Albert, would you answer also how did you, yeah, well. how did you influence the culture of your workforce? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not the leader of this project, um, 15 years ago when this began, but uh, I am living this in the, the actual uh, reality. But um, I'm sure that the, 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 the worst problem is to involve the director of hospitals and the centers, because all of this began with the, with the centralize of the purchasing. Eh? And this is, well, it's difficult. Eh? The, 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 central, the centralize of the purchasing and the uh, unique catalog was the first work and it's hard. Eh? When you did this, all the other flows more uh, fluently. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, all the all the directors and the managers of the hospitals and supervisors and this, uh, all the people who are involved in the in the process, are very uh, satisfied with the with the system. And now, when we are implementing the implant project, all our all flows better than at the beginning, 15 years ago, uh, when all this project began. And then yep. we are reasonable, mm, happy with, with the decision that the, the, the manager of the institute decided. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And 15 years ago, nurses would have to do a lot of writing, a lot of manual work. Yeah. And now they are reduced yeah. in the manual work. And with, yeah, OK. So it speeds but they, up. They, they are, as Santo Tomas, if they don't touch, they don't really no. uh, believe. It's the tradition compassion, but. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> OK, thank you. Another question that we received. Maria, I go back to you now for this one. Can you share with us how has COVID influenced the logistics management at SAS? Um, thanks to the single management system and centralized information, uh, the structure is flexible and we were able to react quickly. We set up to regional warehouse for COVID warehousing and launched um, into international trade and logistics. And here I have to, to thanks again to GS1 Spain, uh, all the help with the knowledge in commercial trade and logistic, in, and logistic international and with the networking. It was very, very useful and, and it was, a, a big help when it was very difficult. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question we received is for Henrik. Henrik, um, you explained a lot about what you have been doing, but where did you get your inspiration? How come you started working on this? Well, um, we, we looked at where were the med, uh, from our point of view, where, where were the well-functioning supply chains back around 2008, 2010, who were pushing a lot of goods around and were being successful at that. And, we, and we, actually, we, uh, uh, it was uh, within the, uh, what do you call it, food supplies, supermarkets, mm -hmm. uh, groceries, and so they, they had the most, developed supply chains and the best data structure for that. If you, if I, can, I can make an example. If you have a, a, a recall of an uh, implant in Denmark, you're obliged to handle that within 72 hours and take it away from the shelf to make sure the patient has that. If you have a recall on cheese, 
the same demand is eight hours. So let's look at what they're doing and use their standards and take them into our model because they were much more connected than we were at that time. Uh, uh, then I have another question which may be connects to this one. Um, Helen asks us when we apply standardization in the supply chain and the use of technology using barcodes, is it, do you have evidence that this intervention can reduce corruption in procurement processes? Would you like to answer that one? No, no, no. Question? I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about corruption. <laughs> do, do, do we s let, me cha let me change the wording a bit. Do we see that there is less counterfeit products in our hospitals when we use the GS1 system? Is that the correct question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, probably we, because we control much better the, the product. So now we, know, we know the stock in every, in every unit of every hospital, and we know if, there is, if something changes, everywhere, every, everybody knows. And, and yeah. Probably, uh, we don't, <laughs> fortunately, we don't have this problem nowadays. Yeah. But uh, I'm sure it's a, it's a uh, you're, you're correct, Albert. It, um, this problem is a big problem in many parts of the world. Yeah. It's a lesser problem in this part of Europe where we have highly regulated, um, highly regulation on medical devices and on pharmaceuticals. But if you, for instance, uh, go to other parts of the world, uh, there is a lot of counterfeit products. And, um, um, one example from my life that I would like to share with you is I worked as a medical doctor in Africa for seven years, way out in the bush, many, many years ago. And uh, the first, the f I didn't know that there were counterfeit drugs, you know. I was a little bit blonde, I think, and I trusted everybody. And then we had an epidemic, um, and uh, I would have, I had supplies, and um, I would notice that the same amount of drugs treated on several patients, one would recover, another one would die, and another one would show toxic reactions. I couldn't understand. I thought uh, that I was failing as a professional. Um, but then, when I digged a bit deeper into the problem, I discovered that this supply had not been delivered from a safe supplier. So in fact, when I was treating a patient, I couldn't be sure that the right amount of drug was in the tablet that we gave. So one was overdosed and the other was, didn't get enough of the substance. And that was my first time to meet uh, substandard medication. And probably it wasn't even counterfeit, it was substandard medication. And that helped me to understand if we need supplies, <coughs> I want it only from safe suppliers. And that helped. And I know there are still many parts in the world where there is n not only substandard medication, but also counterfeit. You've probably also read in the newspapers, because there is regular news on this, there is even counterfeit uh, COVID vaccines in the market in some parts of the world, you know, it's ridiculous, but people earn money on healthcare, so they will try to do that. And when you use this GS1 standard system, you have a safe supplier, they will have manufacturer, they will have their correct barcode on, their barcode will be the one that you scan through the process and you can be completely sure that the same product is the one that you are supposed to give to your patients. If something changes or someone takes another barcode on, immediately your systems, as Albert has built his system and as Henrik has built his system, will alert that, hey, this is not correct. You'll get a blip and you will know, hey, I need to be alert. So yes, the system can be, can be safe, but you need to work on the full system. Um, sorry that I had to answer it for you, but it is like that. Um, 
uh, there, sorry, do you have another question? Um, Henrik, it yeah. looks like IT project. Mm -hmm. And how do doctors or nurses in your hospital like IT or why would they work with you? No, I, I, I don't really believe you, you go into healthcare as a doctor or as a nurse to work with computers, for instance. And, and one of the key things, and I, I also said it in my presentation, is that you need to make this transparent and move it away from being an IT project. This is a quality assurance project. This is about enhancing capabilities within the hospital. And, and the great thing about this system is that you enhance the capability beyond the hospital borders. And I think Maria and Albert said it very well, because if you connect with the data that's produced outside the hospital, it makes much more sense for the professional inside the hospitals to use these methods. <laughs> so, no, yeah. it, it's not an IT project. And okay, no, that's good. But you, as IT, you are needed. You're supporting. Probably, yes. Yeah, no, okay. I have another question for you, Maria. Um, if you would advise anybody, what would be the first step to be able to apply the standards? First, uh, identify the demand, have a centralized and unified catalog. The second step, uh, to order the supply, to have the technical and logistical information of the products ordered according to the catalog. And the third, optimize and homo homogenize to be all the same <laughs> processes and have a single management system. No try to, to put a system to be able to do all the things you do now. You have to order first, and after order, then you can to put a, a system, in, an IT system. Okay, thank you. Albert, would you have any additions to what Maria said? No. She's the president of the Spanish, <laughs> Spanish committee, the logistic committee. I can. <laughs> but you, you use the same steps in your organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. But you are the best member, you know. You are my prefect. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah, that's really good. We are coming close to the end of our session. I would like to ask you if you can put up the last slide with the mail addresses. Uh, all of our presenters uh, are very willing, if you have any questions, that you can drop to them as well and they can answer. That's also for the people who are online. I have also added on the, on the slide that you will see here, you see my mail address and you also see Claire Clark's mail address. Um, I'll be moving out of GS1 soon, but Claire will be there to answer your questions. So please, if you want anything for us at Global Office, drop us an email. We have Monica Soler, who is, so he, she is here. She is supporting in GS1 Spain. And we also have uh, Jesper, who is here as well, who is supporting the implementations in uh, Denmark. And all of them are willing to answer any questions, should you have any questions. Um, and we have a few more questions, but our time is almost up. So those of you who are available here and have a question, please come to us when we finalize the session. And I will uh, check in the app later the questions that we could not answer and I'll make sure uh, together with IHF staff that we do send the correct answers to the people. Then finalizing the session, I first of all want to thank our presenters for taking the time and uh, sharing their messages with us. And thank you again, Albert, for, for stepping in. And please uh, give our best wishes to um, Monica, who uh, could not join us today. And Monica, online, uh, muchas gracias. It was really good to have you here and to have you share your messages. And if there are any specific questions for you, I will know where to find you. And I want to thank all of you who are here in the room, who shared with us, and also the people online. If you have questions after the session, feel free 
to also address to us. Feel free to add in the app uh, your feedback on this session, your key takeaway sessions, and the recording will be available very soon. And we will have, that's the last one on my list, we will have a short coffee break. So um, we'll be here to answer your questions while they arrange the setup for the next team. And then uh, after coffee break, and you, if you want to join the session here, please be back with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.